I think it, it, the essence of it is about entrepreneurialism in food. Um, it's a bit of a difficult word to say that, um, but it's about um, new startup companies, uh, the issues that they face, the opportunities that are open to them. And uh, I think we're trying to understand how you negotiate your pathway to being successful in uh, the food and beverage industry. Yeah, it's um, really nice to get you know get my my sort of story across and let other people know um, how we did it, and um, you know hopefully it can encourage other people to do the same thing and realise that it doesn't always have to be uh, that big a, a mission to open a small <laughs> restaurant. And with the, the likes of crowdfunding now, you know hopefully encourage people to be able to do it without the banks. Um, I definitely think there's a sort of kind of confidence when it comes to starting restaurants and going out to eat and trying new things that um, you know London has sort of grown in in the last sort of five years and I think it's really important the rest of the country does the same thing so hopefully conferences like this get people um, feeling more confident about starting their own thing. Hello everybody, really impressively full room. Um, welcome to the NRB debate. Um, I think this year we've probably, we've probably got one of our most exciting lineups yet. And our aim is really to, to send you away with uh, a head full of insights and, and ideas from, I think, what is a quite uniquely qualified uh, set of people, quite inspirational people. Um, so do use the books, take notes. They're not just for doodling. You don't want to forget all this stuff when you've walked out the door. Um, housekeeping first. Uh, we're leading off with the Food Entrepreneur Panel, who I'll introduce you to shortly. Uh, and then following a short comfort break, we're going to be very hot on timekeeping today. I'll be having a head-to-head -head conversation with Jay Rayner. Um, also, mobile phones off or on silent, please, because we, we will point you out if anyone rings or vibrates. Um, so before we begin, I'd just like to mention Manchester Metropolitan University. They're the sponsors here. Uh, the event wouldn't happen without them. And not only do they have one of the most employee-focused hospitality business management degrees in the UK, but they've also been smart enough to learn, launch the first UK food business entrepreneurism qualification. So if you're an employer, if you're struggling to find the right calibre of employees, you have to be speaking to these guys. They're on your doorstep. They're just down the road. Um, and I'd like to welcome on stage to say a few words, Chris Mitchell from MMU. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to have a one-minute conversation. Tom was very specific. Timekeeping. Timekeeping. So I've quickly <laughs> jotted a few notes now to get into my minute. Um, um, I'd like to welcome you all, obviously, to the debate, first of all. Um, I hope you have a, a, it's a very lively debate, hopefully, and don't make it too easy for the panel. Um, but what I'd like to do is to introduce um, Manchester Met to you all. If you, are, if you aren't working with us already, okay, we're the Hollings faculty at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, we've got a lot of uh, expert academics, researchers, consultants, um, in student researchers, all under one roof in tourism, hospitality, food, events. Okay, so we're very keen to work with industry, and I think that's what uh, Tom was getting across. You know, we, we started to already work with quite a lot of industry partners. We're trying to relation, create partnerships with industry as much as possible. So A, more of our degrees and our students, but B, find out more about what you're doing and how we can help and help you innovate within our sector. And hopefully, um, as, you, as you already know, the, the, the massive restaurant and bar sector is in, is in growth. So we'd like to be part of that growth. So we've worked with quite a few. I've just jotted a few of the people we've been working with thus far. There's only just a few. Um, New Moon Pub Company, Pizza Hut, Yumchi Snacks, Living Ventures, Tender Cow, Third Wave, Co uh, Third Wave Coffee. We work very closely with the hospitality, uh, the hospitality action, with our student projects and things like that. <coughs> We're currently very big on the uh, apprenticeship degrees. I'm sure some of you are very conscious that um, on the horizon of the, the apprenticeship levy. So we're, the, we're one of the first universities in the country to offer apprenticeship degrees. And we've managed to get our hospitality apprenticeship degree right there on the cusp of the wave at the start. So we start in September 2016. Um, we've got a number of um, candidates already signed up to the new degree programme. So we've left lots of information about how we can work together. Um, our new programme, our apprenticeship programme, which is actually targeted industry, geared towards you guys. Okay, we're working with a lot of employers at the moment, a lot of hotel employers. We could really do with some big, strong bar restaurant players. Okay, we've got Pizza Hut involved, we've got Blackpool, Pleasure Beach involved, we've got 
Kendall College through the Hotel, uh, Cumbrian Hotel Association. We need more guys, more of you SMEs and, and uh, medium large enterprises involved as well. Okay, we've got specialist equipment, sensory labs, all of those sort of things. More than happy to work with any of you. We've got a number of staff and a couple of students as well are dotted around the place. Okay, come and speak to us. Plenty of information on the, on the front there for you to grab. Email us. If there's anything we can do and work with you, we're more than willing to listen and work with you all as much as we can. Stop. A minute-ish. A minute-ish. You know, it's not, it's not a baking, it's not a precise science. I think that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. So, and, and now to business. I'd like to introduce the, the four panellists. Um, starting at the, the far end, we have Cynthia Shanmugalingam, who is the founder of, of the quite brilliant Kitchenette down in London. Uh, Gary Usher, who you will know off of Twitter. Chef Patron and owner of Sticky Walnut and Burnt Truffle with uh, one in the oven as well, really, haven't you? Well, yeah, on the cusp. Yeah. yeah, nearly. We'll talk about that. Yeah, a couple of um, then we have John Quilter, entrepreneur, broadcaster and chef. He runs operations as diverse as Food Busker and Crew Cafe. Uh, and then Nick Johnson, whose email signature does actually say head honcho of the award-winning Altringham Market. So, Cynthia, if I could come to you first of all. You were you're the founder of Kitchenette. And, and the report that you produced, The Stake in the Economy, was something that for me really kind of crystallised my passion for working with and supporting independent food entrepreneurs. So could you tell people what Kitchenette was about and what moved you to create it? What need did you see there from the entrepreneurs? Sure. Kitchenette is a food business incubator, so we help people who want to start restaurants to get started um, in the industry. Uh, and there were other incubators in tech and fashion and other places that so far in the UK, when we started, there was nothing in food. And the, the kind of, I guess the, the gap we saw was that if you think about food entrepreneurship, it's one of the most accessible routes into starting your own business of any. It's what people have always done. Um, you know, immigrants who came to this country built up Chinatown and Brick Lane and the Curry Mile here and lots of other um, aspects of our kind of culinary uh, scenes and people who've kind of started as pot washers or washing the dishes in restaurants and gone up to building up their own restaurant empires like um, Marcus Waring and Simon Hopkinson and lots of other people that we know on the telly or in other pe and, and in other places. It's one, of the, it's one of the industries that you can start with no qualifications and maybe lacking an English language and, and go on to really make a success. And, I, and that has grown even more, I think, the accessibility into the industry with, with things like social media and crowdfunding and pop-ups and street food, which has made it more and more open to a whole new generation of people coming into the industry. But it's really, really difficult. It's the hardest industry of any to make work. It's the highest failure rates of any kind of business that you can do. And there wasn't really anything around to support people who were trying to do it. Um, and so Kitchenette is about helping startup food entrepreneurs to get mentoring, to get help with finding a site, and help with raising money, um, and kind of advice, I guess, from people who've done it before. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Nick, question for you. I always think that one of the biggest conflicts with entrepreneurs who tend to be quite individualistic, uh, creative people, is, is to have to deal with the men in suits and, and mm. the corporates at some point. Um, and one of the first junctures is, is and normally... And the food safety people. Food safety people. <laughs> Love them. Um, property is, is something that every, every food entrepreneur has to get their head around. And um, I just thought, I've noticed the way that developers are now looking to work with food entrepreneurs. They've decided it's a way of getting a point of difference or adding integrity or a sense of place to their brand. Do you think it's a happy balance? Do you think there is a balance that works for all parties? De developers and point of difference is, a, is an oxymoron. Uh, developers are like sheep. Mm. Um, and they, they will go wherever the herd is, is heading. Um, and uh, there's a tension, because I, I come from both... Well, I cover both backgrounds, having spent 25 years in property and urban regeneration, um, trying to do things differently. And um, there are a lot of big-name... Um, operators now that are trying to add credibility to their own existence through working with um, uh, food startups. And, and I think that, the, the, that they're trying to bathe themselves with this credibility that goes along with the idea uh, of this, this new, uh, emergent, exciting uh, industry. And I, I think it's very difficult because I think that they are, um, they're not particularly well versed. They don't have particularly good taste. They aren't able to select uh, the right people. So what you're tending to find, uh, by and large, is that they will 
um, very often, uh, there, are, there are very few instances where developers have worked well with independent uh, operators or startups. In, in a lot of instances, they just default down to the uh, cleverly branded um, uh, uh, multiple uh, operators. And I, I think that that's a really sad indictment, actually. And I think, um, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, the, the failure rate in, in, in startup bus businesses uh, around uh, food, and food and beverage is very high. So uh, the, the, the developers are really wrestling with it, this unexploded bomb, and they're not quite sure when it's going to go off. And I think uh, uh, they need to understand th the industry in more detail. They need to understand and be flexible and uh, uh, mould themselves around uh, the food entrepreneurs to give them some support if they're genuine, if, th if they genuinely want something special to happen. And I think that that's more or less wholly absent from the property industry. So you, you don't feel there's someone at the minute who's getting it right or, or a model that we can look to in the UK or further afield? Um, I don't think there is anybody. I think that they are all... Uh, um, th th look, th they treat... Uh, by and large, the property developer will treat the, the, the food and beverage element of what they're doing as part of the PR budget, not as part of the... Um, of, of the the wealth generation to the uh, uh, development scheme. So uh, they will spend, you know, they'll have a couple of million pounds to spend on, on marketing and PR, and they'll burn that on supporting, uh, or, well, not, not supporting, supporting is the wrong word, but they will, they will burn that on setting up uh, an initiative, which on paper looks quite sexy, but in the reality of mm. it is that it lacks content or it's not good enough. And I think that that's pretty, uh, pretty common, and I think that um, they're, they're not treating it with the seriousness with which it needs to be uh, dealt with. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, uh, good perspective there. John, if I, I could just come to you. I think one of the most interesting things about what you do, it's become a bit of a, a buzzword, but you're a, a classic example of a, a portfolio worker in that you don't just have a job. Um, you've got so many strings to your bow. You have Crew Cafe, you have the food busking, you work with Jamie on Food Tube as well, but you started out in the kitchen originally and then a restaurateur? Or? Kitchen porter when I was 16. There you go. So could you, I mean, I think the portfolio working idea is interesting for entrepreneurs because it, it can enable them to have flexibility and balance and kind of share the risk out of doing their own thing with maybe some more steady employment. How did it work for you? How did you end up with the balance that you've now got and what are the pros and cons? Um, yeah, I mean, Cynthia was talking about earlier, but it's like there's so many dyslexics in catering. I'm dyslexic. Jamie's dyslexic. <coughs> Jimmy from Jimmy's Farm, he's dyslexic. And I think there's some, uh, I was looking at it earlier, but 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. And um, I sought to um, manage my own thing because doing it for somebody else, I was always being told I was wrong, I was getting it wrong. At school, I didn't fit into the, the very narrow um, idea of what successful was. I was in all the remedial classes, and, you know, my teachers and my peers were telling me that I was thick and I, I wasn't going to become anything. And so you have to, you either succumb to that or you try to come up with a solution, right? And that's what dyslexic, um, mere mortals like you, you only see. Um, sort of images, you see one image per two or three seconds. Dyslexics can see up to 32 images in one second. And the fastest way to learn is watching a video, right? Pictorial picture. Um, and so, I guess for me, and I was crap at everything, until I walked into a kitchen, and then I just got it. And, and I guess it's because I see things, and, and I think, you know, I think that for me, working in a kitchen was the first thing that I was good at. I just got it. I got the dance of being in a kitchen, getting out of the way of the head chef. And, and I think that it's a great incubator for entrepreneurialism and thinking outside of the box. And I think more and more people are going to need to do that today because the traditional career of 40 years, it's diminishing. And how, how do you manage the kind of headspace? Because you, you've got an online retail operation, but then you're, you're doing a lot of film and media stuff as well. It, it must be quite difficult. You, you must almost have to kind of flip your head into different gears to go between yeah. these different Yeah, it is areas. a bit challenging sometimes, but I get so excited about the opportunity to leverage one thing to get another. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it opens and unlocks doors, and, and it's so exciting to be able to be involved in other things. I think that um, it, is, it is challenging, and um, <laughs> I, don't know what the, I don't really know what the answer is. It must work, um, or else you'd do something different. You, yeah. you haven't ever I wanted to just narrow down and go, do you know what, I'm just going to do crew, or I'm just going to do the food I just couldn't do one thing. It drives me mad. And I think that, um, I think for me, I've made that many mistakes 
that it just had to start working at some point. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just balls it up so many times. It's a lesson. And, that um, and, but that's the problem with this mm. country is that, you know, if you're on uh, the west coast of America, you know, you, you balls up a business and they go, great, what are you going to do next? Mm. Here, you balls up a business like, right, well, you should just sod off back into the, yeah. you know, you're a failure. And it's, it fucking really annoys me because it's so wrong and it's like we've got to... We've got to encourage creativity. We've got to encourage, you know, what annoys me about a lot of cities outside of London is they're just being sanitized mm. by the sort of things that Nick was talking about. And these developers cynically take in big cash from big brands that, that rob the cities of their individualism. Mm. And the whole reason why I'm, a, I'm attached to, to Manchester in a way is I, because of the Hacienda. I came here in 89 and 90 because it was the you know, it hasn't happened since I can remember that a, that a city outside of London drew people from London to come up here. And they did that because they went bollocks to what everybody else did. We're just going to do our thing. And it was so strong and so amazing. And, but unfortunately for Manchester, I, I don't, I, the, it, it needs to step out on its own, as a lot of cities do. But the problem with that is, is that there's not the support for it. The developers, um, I, I totally concur. It only works at the very top, five mm. star, because there's so much bloody money. Mm. And the reason it doesn't work is because there's not good money for these sort of businesses, the middle market and, and lower down before. And that's what one of the massive challenges is, is that there's not good finance, there's not good investment money to help develop that. But, to, but if you do that, and develop is one of the ways that can do that, you're talking about making cities great. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we're going to come back on to uh, finance later on, but Gary, I'm, I'm going to come across to you because um, I think one of the really interesting things that Cynthia's report articulated was the idea that if you go back 20 years or whatever, there was very set routes into food and drink. If you're passionate about food and drink and you wanted a career, you either did your city and guilds and became a chef or you did a hospitality management degree and work for a big hotel chain um, <coughs> and you needed a big advertising budget, you needed to get a bank loan, you needed to find a prime site, there were all these tick boxes which made it incredibly difficult and, and that's changed and I think your experience with Sticky Walnut is a, is a kind of um, an exemplar of how the paradigm shifted so I wondered if you could talk us through how you started Sticky Walnut and how the experience yeah. was. Hearing John's story is actually like hearing, my, it's like hearing myself speak, um, I went through the same um, I had all the troubles in school as well. Um, I was told exactly the same. Um, I did care, but they just said I was thick. It was exactly the same. Um, I got into kitchens, and um, yeah, it was where I where I I was in my element. Um, so, um, how did Sticky come about? Um, I'd always wanted my own place, um, and um, it was a case that there was a there was a there was a rundown restaurant which was which was pennies to take over. Um, and it was a case of borrowing off whoever I could, uh, not changing the restaurant in any way um, other than a second-hand oven. We kept all the rubbish that was in there and gave it a lick of paint. Um, and it was just about going for it, really. Um, I don't think there was any sort of... Um, I think the main thing was that I was... <clears throat> because I was so worried about uh, not doing well... Um, I was almost hiding in this place. So when it came to um, PR and that type of thing, I just, I didn't want to do any because I didn't want anyone to know about <laughs> it. I didn't want anyone to know that we were open. Did, didn't, so I, didn't you famously tell national critics not to come expressly? Yeah, I bloody come. meant it as well, yeah. Um, <laughs> they didn't listen though? No, they didn't listen, no. Everybody thinks it was some kind of thing where I was doing it on purpose. <laughs> I really didn't want her to come. Um, I really meant it. We were um, from, from from day dot, I, w I, had, I had no confidence, um, but, but I was, one thing I did have was I was going to work as hard as I could. So we, we were putting all this effort into just, just doing what we could, and um, the way that I saw it was I didn't want anyone to travel to the restaurant. I just wanted to cook for the people that, in that small neighbourhood, and if they liked it, that was great, and hopefully they'd tell their friends, and their friends would come, their friends in that neighbourhood would come. And um, when, it was a, a, when that food critic... It was Marina, wasn't it? It, it was, was Marina, yeah. Guardian. Yeah, she said, um, so I think, sorry, I think she said, she said, um, she said that somebody had, somebody had uh, brought her into a, a tweet saying, you should really go to Sticky Walnut. Um, and I, I said, look, it's a 400 mile round trip. There's far better restaurants in London that you can go to and not bother. And she thought I was 
taking the piss, but I was being serious. <laughs> the, I, I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm deadly serious about this. And she came up and she enjoyed it. Um, and and tell, tell, it, tell me about social media, though, because yeah. it's a really big part of what you do. It's huge. Uh, it's a huge part of what you it's do. Huge, so what, yeah. what does it allow you to do? And what do you think you do differently that's helped you turn Sticky Walnut into what it is? Yeah. Um, uh, I sort of, I kind of know a million answers for this, and then I also don't know any um, because I didn't have a plan. This is the worst thing about being asked in this situation because I know a lot of people would generally like to know how it works for us and why it works for us, and I'm not sure why it does. I think it's just, it's, it, I think part of it's brutal honesty. Um, we, we were speaking earlier, and yeah, we were yeah. saying that, you know, when a when the restaurant was dead and it had no one in it at lunch, well, I would take pictures of that and say. <laughs> You know, look at look, we're we're flying over here. Look at this. You know, come and come and join all these guys. <laughs> and, um, I, I people people found it funny. I think they like the honesty. I think to we appeal to lots of people in the industry um, without disrespecting lots of other chefs because I am one. Chefs love another chef that says cock or <laughs> wank, and we said things like that on social media. Um, so chefs loved it. It made other it, it made people in the industry talk about it. So. That worked for us. Um, I think our food was quite possibly chefy as well, in the sense that it not chefy in the sense of fancy food, but chefy in the sense of you know something like braised and chips is often if a chef did come to the restaurant, that would be what they would eat um, because they're cooking lots of fine dining food and that type of thing. And they'd come and have that, and it would be the humble sort of thing that they'd want to eat. So I think we we connected to lots of industry, and I think once we'd connected to the industry, that that that. I think that spread out a little bit to, to guests and maybe people that weren't in the, in the industry. I think if you've got the industry supporting you, then that's, that's, a, you know, that's a key thing, I think, Fantastic. and I think we did. Well, I, I know the, uh, the kind of current chapter um, touches on crowdsourcing, which we'll, we'll come back to when we talk um, funding. But just onto a more general question, which I'd probably pitch out to you, first of all, um, Cynthia. Entrepreneurs, the, the, ty the type of traits that make you a fantastic entrepreneur can make you an appalling manager of a business, process and systems and paperwork, and the, there is no industry with more paperwork probably than the hospitality sector. And you must see a lot of startups. And when do you think, and, and what is the process whereby an entrepreneur realises they need to actually start putting in senior management or putting in structure? How do you make that transition from one person living the brand to actually growing a company? I don't know if I agree that entrepreneurs make bad managers. I think some, some do and some don't. Some grow into that side of it. And you, I think one of the wonderful things about, on, about starting your own business is you find out that you sort of like the marketing side or the social media. So you sort of find out that you're like, oh, well, actually, understanding the numbers is great. And what did we do last Friday? And what what happened and getting under that and being able to talk to your accountant about it and understand what the beating heart of the business is, which is what the money is doing, it, uh, can be sort of an enjoyable thing for people. But I think it comes down to you know, basically one, one thing, which is knowing what you're good at and what you, need, what you need support on and not trying to do it all yourself. And I think it just basically just depends on, on the size of your business. So you know, if you've got a small business, you might not need to necessarily have a full-time manager come in and do and take on take on running it for you but you might have you know a, a restaurant accountant who does lots of restaurants and can basically act as your finance director kind of outsourced or you might have a PR company that helps you with that um, but but I certainly think none of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with yet or they may, I think many of them would like to none of them have got to the stage of having multiple sites mm -hmm. um, but at that point seems fair to say that having some management structure in place is really important and all of the kitchenette mentors who who kind of have done have been through it they, and they, i think people have done it all sorts of different ways some knew from the start and set it up in the way that would scale and and they sort of thought about what a regional manager might look like and kind of tried to grow the talent internally and others started with more of a mess and then had to unpick it a bit as they grew um, and i don't know if there's any hard and fast rule yeah well, it, it's interesting that you've, um, you've actually kind of knitted mentoring into what you do at KitchenAid. It's not just about the space and the facilities and the kind of agglomeration. It, it, it is about having experienced people in there. Um, because we've done quite a lot of research on the north of England, and one of the things that we found is that amongst the small operators up here, a much 
lower number of them have non-exec directors than comparable businesses in London. There seems to be almost a, a shortage or a lack of awareness as to what non-execs can bring to the business. Um, and they can bring good things and they can bring bad things, but the idea is that you bring someone who's been there and done that and, and can take you through that process. And Nick, I don't know whether you think that is something that's holding the industry back up here and whether non-execs are important or not. Um, well, I, I like the definition, of, well, there are two definitions of non-execs. Um, are either complementary? One is uh, that they are, uh, they are like B-days. Uh, that they, they make the room look classy, but nobody wa knows what the hell they're for. <laughs> um, and the other is uh, the, the similarity between the uh, non-exec and uh, a, sh a supermarket shopping trolley. You, you stuff them full of booze at Christmas, and you don't know which direction they're going to head. <laughs> and that pretty much sums up my experience of non-execs. Fantastic. Well, there you go. That's quite watertight, <laughs> isn't it? If he hasn't put you off already, is it something you've considered, John, or you, Gary? Or um, do you think you need that in the business at some point? It, I think it depends on the business and it depends on the founders that are running the business. Um, I was talking to, uh, it was the guy, it was like, the, he ran M&S before Brian Roses or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And um, he was instrumental in the creation of Ocado. So, a car, so huge business with massive ambitions. And um, the bankers that created that business, when they started off, they were asking for 30 million. And so they took these, this guy from uh, M&S, the non-exec, just to sort of say, well, we do know what we're doing. But really, at that stage, creating that thing was all about getting the finance and getting the money in place. Um, it was a B-day then. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A very expensive one. And... Um, and then, so, and if I look at my coffee business, we don't have non, uh, no non-execs at the moment. That's because we've got three strong founders. Mm -hmm. uh, will we look to do it at some point? Well, we're trying to grow, uh, to build a global coffee business. So yes, because if you want to grow a global business, then you're going to need cash. Mm -hmm. And finance is the biggest challenge yeah. for, for, business, for, for businesses. Yeah. And I think, you know, going back to the thing that we're talking about with, with smaller businesses, I think... Uh, hospitality's greatest strength is its biggest weakness. So hospitality is, if you're in hospitality, I think you care, right? You're emotional. You want to give uh, a good experience to the customer. It's not just about looking at your pay packet at the end of the day. You get a real vibe from people bouncing out the door, be it a chef or a waiter or a manager. But you get an awful lot of reward from, from giving a great experience. The problem is, is that same passion and that same emotion uh, means that you don't dispassionately look at your business when you start it off. And that's, I think, why a lot of food businesses fail, mm. is that we fall in love with the location or we fall in love with what we're doing. Or, you know, we were talking earlier uh, about people come to Cynthia and go, I don't want to rush them out the door and I want them to have a really nice experience. And it's like, that's great, but you'll be working Christmas, you won't be going on holiday and you won't have a life and your yeah. wife's going to leave you. So, do you know what I mean? And it's like people There's a lesson for you young entrepreneurs out there. <laughs> no. So, yeah, so I just, yeah. Okay. And funding, we talked about funding a lot. Um, Gary, obviously, you, you've taken a very different approach to funding. You've, you've made crowdfunding just look like the easiest thing in the world that you kind of just do in a couple of days. H how and why did you choose crowdfunding, and how has it worked for you? What's the experience been like? Um, well, it's been amazing. <clears throat> it's been amazing. It's created awareness of the restaurants uh, that wasn't necessarily there before. Um, why did we do it? We did it because in year two of Sticky, when we had been making money, um, the bank could clearly see that. Um, we needed aircon because there was also lots of complaints about how hot it was. So I asked for £10,000, um, which I thought at the time was ridiculously small, you know, in comparison to what we were doing and how, 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 how we were coping. And they said no, um, so I had to find funding for, to put aircon in the restaurant, which, which just completely flattened me because I thought that the bank was there. My dad always told me stories when I was younger about how you know, the bank manager was somebody that you'd get to know and that when you go and see them, make sure you're in a suit and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get to know them. They'll know your business. You can talk to them. You'll have a relationship with them. Well, I, I still believed that, but this is a story from 25 years ago. So when I, when I found out that that wasn't what was going to happen and that we weren't supported by them, well, we weren't anyway, um, I, I needed to find other routes and um, other ways. Sticky was ready. We were ready as a team. Um, 
people were going to leave me, not in a sense of, you know, I'm going to leave if there's no promotion, but just a natural progression of their career, they would go to find the next thing. By me opening up another site, it meant that I could do it in an in-house style, which is, you know, what, what great for everyone. Um, so uh, a friend had mentioned um, crowdfunding, particularly Kickstarter. My brother had already done it for his book. Um, so, yeah, so we, so we looked at it, and, um, and then without any sort of planning or any sort of structure or ideas, we just made a video and did it and put it up, and that was it. And, um, yeah, it ended up being successful. I, um, and how far away are you from the latest one? You are mid-Kickstarter as we speak, we are, aren't we? Yeah, we're a couple of grand away from the target, which was 50 grand. Um, and that's for the third restaurant in Chalton? That's it. That's for Hispy, yeah, hopefully. Fantastic. Well, maybe by the end of this debate, you might have um, just tipped over yeah. 50. If you see people on their phones, that's, they're not <laughs> bored, they're, they're funding. Yeah. Um, one final question, just as we bring this first session to, um, to a close, and it, it ties in really with MMU being the, the sponsor and supporter of this event. Can you teach entrepreneurism? And if you can't, then can you at least try to find the promising entrepreneurs and support them and give them information and, and put a kind of support system in around them? I'd start with you, Nick, as to what you think. Um, I don't think you can teach entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism or entrepreneurism. I'm not quite sure. Either one. It's fine. Um, I don't think it's easily taught. And I think what's, what, what unites uh, many of us sat up here is that um, you're driven by passion. You're often challenged uh, f for one reason or another, be that uh, through dys dyslexia or... Um, y and the, the problem with, with um, new businesses... Oh, oh, one of the things that I think you were describing was, was a sense of naivety, passion, but, but naive. And I think naivety is actually one of the greatest business assets. I think if, if uh, you know, we've done a lot of businesses, we started up a lot of businesses, and if, if, if Jen and I knew what we know, now know about those businesses which we have started, we probably wouldn't have gone into them, or we wouldn't have started them. So naivety is um, I incredible, really, because it, it, it doesn't allow you to see all the pitfalls, all the obstacles, um, and you, it, you, your passion drives you forward. And I think that that's incredibly important, that na the naivety that... I think we mm. have all encountered is embraced, and you know, uh, uh, my I'm 50 now, so I've, I've been through and held positions in the great and the good of the establishments here and in London, and uh, realised in 2012 that actually the more impressive my CV became, the more impotent and uninteresting I had become, <laughs> and uh, I, I decided to renounce any position of authority. So I withdrew from pretty much every uh, organisation that had given me a title. And we threw ourselves back into being scared, into not knowing what was round the corner, into trying to not spend money <coughs> deliberately. It wasn't, by that stage, we've, we've got a few quid. But the idea of not spending it and doing something with very <coughs> little is incredibly invigorating. And so, you know, we've got there, at the age of 50, we decided that we, the most exciting and visceral time in our lives was when we were half our age. Now, we can't wind the clock back, we can't go back 25 years unfortunately, but what we can do is embrace people who are half our age and who are incredibly talented and uh, deserve to be richly rewarded both uh, critically and financially. And by recognising their talents and by embracing them and be becoming part of what they are, we're actually able to stimulate uh, new business startups that have in Altrincham's case, have become uh, quite profound in their impact and, and clearly uh, successful because we're feeding 7,000 people a week now. Um, so it, it's, um, I, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss uh, um, that sense of naivety, the importance of naivety, and we shouldn't always pursue um, um, funding uh, 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 or, or we shouldn't always... You know, big, bigness is, is an enemy in a lot of respects. I, I can understand... Um, you know, a, a desire to deliver or, or, or build a global coffee brand. But actually, bigness becomes terribly uninteresting at a certain point. Yeah. Independence and uh, uh, being fleet of foot and not tied into uh, what other people think or particularly what your funders and your banks uh, feel you should do is, is probably uh, the most important thing 
uh, the most important <coughs> aspect of being in business. That's great, thank you. And Cynthia, if I could just pass that question <laughs> over to you, I suppose the fact that you created Kitchenette uh, demonstrates that you think agglomeration is important, that, that people not being isolated, being brought together adds benefit. You think that the entrepreneurs work well all sparking off each other and that's part of it. Definitely. Uh, so I, I think entrepreneurship can be taught, um, for sure. And I think that, I think that there's a sort of a slightly, I don't know if it's on the panel, panel of as the only woman, but I think there's a slightly macho idea of like the idea of an entrepreneur and it's someone who's sort of got lots of gusto and they know what they're doing and whatever. And, and I think some of the frankness we've heard on the panel today about having no confidence and wondering if you were the guy and if you had all the skills and whether you could do everything. I think almost every entrepreneur I've ever met has this kind of struggle, struggle through those crises of confidence. Um, and I think that the, there's a sort of principle, operating principle at the heart of KitchenAid, which is borrowed from technology, which is this idea of a minimum viable product. Which is like, what is a, what is a low cost, low heartache way of figuring out if you've got an idea that's going to fly in the market? Which is why a, a pop up or a supper club or, or a street food business is better than a two million pound restaurant and fit out and whatever before you know if you've got a market there. And how do you grow the business? You know, once you've done, if you, even when you, you've done a, your first night as a, you know, if you've done a, one supper club f for friends or for people that you know, you know, the fundamentals of how the business works, you know, how do you market it to people and how do you get them to come and who's going to greet them and how do you get the food out at the same time and how much did you take and how much did you spend on the venue? All of that's basically what a restaurant is, but scaled up, you know, to you know, X many kind of uh, degrees. And, and I think that if with support and encouragement and, and good advice and just knowing mistakes that other people made, um, that the journey from from having an idea to setting something up that's successful can be made much easier, you know, for sure. And also, yeah, d certainly being in a, in a group of people and knowing other people go through the same things as you, you know, how much they're spending on printed coffee cups or whatever. All of those, yeah, all of those, mu those things add up to, to to being so valuable for sure. Fantastic. And Gary, um, if you could have your your kind of time over again, then what? What, what have you learned along the way that you wish someone had told you up front? What would have made the difference to you? Well, um, what have I learned that would, that would make a difference? Yeah, what have, you, what have you learned through trial and error, through the, the kind of process of establishing three restaurants that you now think there's a shortcut here? I shouldn't have done this, or I could have just done that, or I've now learned this is more important than I previously no, realised. No, like, <coughs> I've liked making the mistakes. I think if there was somebody that had told me um, ways of not making them. I think, I think the mistakes have made us who we are. Um, they've enabled us to work out where we need to be better and why. Whereas if somebody tells you that, um, it's not always the right way of finding out. Um, it's funny, the question about um, can you teach it, I think it's really interesting about the naivety comment because I, I so agree with that. Mm. Um, I've got friends in the <coughs> who are at um, my age now and they're at that stage where, <coughs> sorry, where they're, they're thinking about doing it for themselves and I think they are asking me, you know, I'm, I'm ready, we, we, we could, you know, shall I do this and shall I do that? And I don't, think, I don't think it's about advice for anybody to do it. I don't think it's about whether they're at the right time or not. It's the risk. Mm -hmm. It is the naivety. It is just doing it. It's doing it with, and knowing that it could go wrong. And I think it's that going in sometimes head first yeah. in these things is what makes it a success. Mm. Um, you I, I talk to a friend who says, you're mad, you're mad, you're opening the third one and you haven't done this yet. And I say, well, no, you're not always gonna have, you're not always gonna have all this in place. You won't, when we opened Sticky, the first check that came on was two dishes that I'd never even tried. I mean, that, <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but that, that was a lot of the approach of what we had, not, not stupidity, but a touch of naivety, mm. and I think that's so important. Um, yeah. So it's the it's the risk, and you know the fact that that is that is going to be part of it. And John, what what, what would you um, what would you tell a young entrepreneur? Yeah, I um, I, I, I agree. And for me, I, I always say um, that I try to maintain a sense of innocence, and that I think there's so much of stuff that we could do with unlearning. Absolutely. And um, and I think that. Um, if you feel like you're an entrepreneur, then you are going to learn to have a dance with uncertainty. Mm. 
and um, that that's where it is. And I think that, you know, that's what it's about. And you get, I love listening to people who know it all and, um, and, and listening to them tell me all the reasons why you shouldn't do something. Mm. And it's just a nonsense. And perfectionism is trussed up as fearfulness. And it, the, the reality is, is that um, um, it's like, I used to, I remember when uh, Marmalade failed my restaurant, I moved to London. I just started cooking on the streets every weekend. And I didn't even charge people a set price. I said, you pay me what you think it's worth. And I did it for a year. And the amount of people that come to me, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> You're stupid. What the you know, and it turned into uh, be a major part of two TV series. It's now a joint venture with Jamie Oliver. Um, and I'm lucky enough to get flown around the world and do different things off the, 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 the base Amazing. of that. Even I was going when I was pulling my <laughs> stuff out of, uh, in December and it was raining, going, you used to have like 40 staff and a, <laughs> and a, and a house. What the? And it's like you have to maintain a, a, a schizophrenia, a, 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 um, a sense of um, uh, uncertainty, and this, you know, I call it a, 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 a be fiercely protect some sense of innocence. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, my timekeeping has gone horribly awry already, <laughs> but it, I think that was such interesting, inspirational stuff that it, it would have been uh, wrong to uh, cut it off in its prime. So we're a little bit behind, but we do have time for questions from the floor. We have a roving mic at the back there. So if anyone wants to wave a hand, if anyone has a question for the panel, there's a gentleman there in a blue shirt. Ah, I know who that is. Hello, Thomas. Hello, hello. Yeah, good. Hi, I'm Thomas uh, from Vazenda. Um I'm listening to everybody talking there, and um, and two things popped in my mind. You know, we are in a point uh, we're expanding and we're growing as a company, and uh, growth is always scary because first time, you know, you might be have been lucky a little bit, a little bit. There's always a little bit of luck, and then there's a point when you start getting bigger and you start being. It's not more a restaurant; it's a business, and I think you said it in perfect words. Why, or how? does a business start being a little bit more smart and make the right decisions when you have the money and stop having that fear? Because I agree with you, the fear is what makes you a little bit you know, more aware of what you're doing. But now we've gone, a couple of opportunities are just around the corner for us to open and we're just scared of making a mistake. And that little fear sometimes can stop you. And uh, how do you battle that little fear? You know, you, you, you said it before, to, you know. Anyone want to pick that up? Yeah, John, anybody. Like, yeah. Yeah. An I know I was looking at you because I think you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think what Nick said about size is a really relevant point. And you shouldn't... And I, I, what helps me make decisions is I believe everything, every decision and everything that we do, when you really boil it down, sits into two camps. That you do it out of love or you do it out of fear, right? And if you do that little exercise with everything that comes to you, make decisions based in love, uh, you're doing it for the right reasons, um, then I think good things will come from that. And I think if you operate from a place where we better, we should do this, you know, should, yeah? <laughs> Should's a nonsense. You know, if, I sh if I'd have done what I should have done, you know, so I wouldn't be very... You start being cleverer in a way because you learn from what you did before. You start analyzing things a little bit different than what you did at the first time. You know, the first time you opened your first place, or the first place, it was all heads in. But when you have a head and you take a little more care of it, you start analyzing things a little bit more. What is that? Can, can I, can I, I can perhaps give you a little bit of insight because for 25 years I was deputy chief exec at the property company Urban Splash, and we grew from a very uh, well, I, you know, our tail starts back in the mid-90s, uh, building up a, uh, a, a leading urban regeneration company doing really challenging projects. And uh, I was with, on, the, on that journey, on, involved in that adventure for the best part of 20 years. And um, for the first five years, it was incredibly... Uh, invigorating and exciting and we were challenging all manner of preconceptions about uh, what you did in that industry and we were being incredibly successful um, we then started to feel that we ought to take ourselves a little bit more seriously that we were no longer this startup that we were 
um, worthy of appointing non-exec directors, and we were capable of B days. We were capable of working with uh, big name architects to do large scale projects, and employing a financial director, and all the conventions that go with growing businesses. I think the day that the decision when we took on those people, the soul of the business died, and we became uh, pretty much the same as everybody else. And that's the real danger, that's the real challenge. The only way I think for moving forward, and I'm still ambitious and I still want to um, build a business, but we, you have to re remain completely in touch with the child, the inner child, the, the 18, 25-year-old <laughs> that had that burning ambition that can still be scared and still make those mistakes. Because the minute you begin to lose touch uh, with, with those essential issues, you will lose the spirit and the soul of your business, and it will die. Thomas, we're going we're gonna to move on. Have we got the mic back? I think if we take one more question, the, the guys are going to be here during the break, so I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you came and spoke to them individually, but let's take one more question from the floor. Lady down there. Hi, uh, Shirley Kumar from Harper's. With all the um, sort of risk-taking, how do you protect your suppliers? Who are you directing that to? So who do you want to pick that up? Any of them, really. Who, who Anyone who may have gone bankrupt and set up again? Because obviously with a restaurant you are dealing with small suppliers, possibly small wine merchants, small drink suppliers, and you've got to protect their businesses as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's probably a good question for me to answer because I did go bankrupt. And um, it's, uh, I, um, I wasn't... The bank manager didn't tell me to, to go bankrupt. I got to the point where I'd been robbed three times in six months. We had a kitchen fire uh, the day before Valentine's, um, the busiest day of the year. Uh, all manner of things went a nightmare. And one of my old suppliers is actually in the, uh, in the audience. And, um, and you know, I, I, it, was, it was the toughest, one of the toughest things I ever went through. But I just made the decision um, that I believed that I was miserable and it was crap. And I was never going to get to where I knew I could get to. I was either going to be a slave to this, to Punch Taverns, the biggest brewery um, in the, the country, who was screwing me to death on my um, lease and would not renegotiate. Um, or, I, um, or I just <laughs> grabbed the bull by the horns and sort the shit out. And so all the small suppliers I paid, all the mid-term suppliers I paid half, and all the big ones I didn't pay. And I actually worked for my fruit and veg supplier as a delivery driver for three months. And I was delivering fruit and veg to uh, the lead station, the restaurant that Nick owns, that my competing business just over the road from me, walking in at 6 o'clock in the morning, going, I really hope I don't see Nick. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's like, um, yeah, it's difficult. And I, I tell you what, there are, uh, there are businesses that we all look up to, who are based in London, who are operating at a loss, that are actually bankrupt in reality, and will punish their fruit and veg supplier and their existing suppliers. And if I told you who you were, you wouldn't believe it. Mm, yeah. uh, and they do it all, and they unfortunately do it all at a different time. Um, you know, it's a really messy uh, industry. I don't know if that answered your question, but well, yeah. I think I think it's a very good answer, and it's a, a good point at which to um, break. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panel for the the, the honesty. Uh, the insight that they've shown. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I hope that you've all enjoyed the first session. We're going to have a short uh, comfort break. I think the euphemism is go and make a call, go for a wee, whatever it is you need to do. But we're going to be back here in five minutes, strictly five minutes with Jay Rayner. So do rush back. And please, a round of applause for all four <coughs> of the panel. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. It's really great to... Uh, be in a room with a bunch of restauranters and hoteliers uh, with some of your peers and talk about the topics that we all want to chew the fat on. And now we're into the one-to-one -one format um, with Jay Rayner, uh, an award-winning writer, journalist and broadcaster and a man never knowingly under-opinionated. Uh, Jay, welcome to Manchester, a city you, you're never short of opinions on. Um, it's I a think delight to be here again as ever. I, I, as always, yes. As always. My starter, because I think it's a, it's a good scene setter for the rest of the discussion. Mm. What is a restaurant critic? Well, what my job is... What is your job? What is it for? What does a restaurant my critic job exist for? My job is, uh, if you're old-fashioned, my job is to sell newspapers or, 
if you're being more modern, my job is to bring as many eyeballs to the website of the Guardian Observer so that we can flog advertising and make a living. Now... That's not the answer most people expect. No, it's not. But um, what that means is I am not selling restaurants. I am there to write a column that is as compelling for the readers as possible. Now, there are very many interpretations to how you do that. I would say included in that is being authoritative, being true, being reliable, uh, and being entertaining. But what it's not is I, I am not part of the restaurant industry when I'm writing. the. I have views on it. I have views on many things. Um, I have you know, views like dogs have fleas. But that is the point of a restaurant critic. I am employed for how I write, not for how I eat, um, and read for that reason as well. And do you feel any kind of sense of duty to the restaurants? I know there's a kind of unwritten rule that you don't go in there early, you let a restaurant bed in. You know, the, you do have I feel some a sort I feel a sense of duty to, to the restaurants as I do to any journalistic subject that I cover. And I've written about everything, I think you know. The only thing I've never written about is sport. Amazing to think that, looking at me. Uh, although I did once cover the all amateur natural bodybuilding championships. You know, there's people who paint themselves orange and look like condoms full of walnuts. Yes. Um, that was the nearest I came to sport. So I've covered everything, and one has, as a journalist, a responsibility to your subject to represent them in a fair light, in a reasonable way, um, and to do fair dealing. As you say, um, I endeavour not to go into restaurants early. If they're on a soft launch, um, I will not review. If, however, you're charging full price, I don't care how long you've been open, you're fair game. Fine. OK. So you review on a one-off. That's what a review is. You go in there once. How do you feel, therefore, if you, if you have a bad experience and then you find out that the head chef was off that night or something like that, and you think, well, hold on, is my experience typical or am I almost yeah. not correctly informing my readers because this isn't a typical experience? I think you're still able to tell some, quite a lot about that business. I... Uh, gave a bad review to quite a well-known restaurant in this city. And I have to say, by the way, I, I actually did the count. Um, literally dozens of restaurants I've reviewed in Manchester over the time I've been doing the job. I gave a bad review to a restaurant and subsequently learned that the chef had left and there was somebody else in the kitchen. Um, my view of that is, well, they didn't shut, they didn't reduce the prices. Clearly, that business is problematical. And who's to say there wouldn't be a similar problem if somebody else went back? Mm -hmm. So if the prices are where they're at and it's still that restaurant, then it's entirely fair. OK. You're a national critic. We have quite a few national critics in this, in this country, but the word national is in, in inverted commas because you and Marina yeah. are actually the only people who seem to bother to come and review up north, get out of London on a regular basis. So I love you all. Why, but why is that important? Why does that matter to you? Well, we why are national critics. Effort? Actually, it's, uh, you, should, you should try having this conversation from the perspective of Edinburgh or Glasgow, where it's appalling, frankly. We are not national critics in that sense. Um, we do have a national readership, and we do have uh, a remit to cover the country. Now, it's tough to protect regional pride. People would like me to say there are great restaurants everywhere in enormous number, and there aren't. Um, London has pulled away from the rest of the country in a way that I don't think is economically healthy. I really don't. You now compare London to Tokyo, Paris, New York. Um, but there are good things. You just have to look for them more carefully. I think you know that I do, a, I do a show about terrible restaurant experiences. It has been mentioned. Yeah, and actually all the examples I give are in London, because I'm not stupid. <laughs> um, and you tour this show, a show around the regions, don't you? Yeah, because you don't want to turn up in Liverpool and slag off one of theirs on no. stage. Mind you, London Carriage Works. <sighs> um, <laughs> Stop, Jay. <laughs> it wasn't very good. But no, we have a responsibility to do it. But... It's also justifiable from you know, the point of view of A.A. Gill or Giles Corrin if they say, well, there's nothing good outside the, the circle line. If their editors are still employing them and their readers are still reading them, that may not please people in the industry, but unfortunately that's the way it works. But isn't it that we never see the counterfactual? What would happen if they reviewed more restaurants outside the UK? Would they Outside the UK? Uh, outside the UK, outside I've of London. That. Would their numbers suddenly fall? You know, I don't believe they would. Um, no, it would take an awful lot more effort on their part. Me, I love riding trains. Uh, yeah, I know. You know the uh, West Coast main line very well. Uh, I'm very good on all the main lines. They know me at the platform barriers in London. Excellent. Um, it's tragic. They really do. I mean, I'm not going to make an argument for, for Gill or Corrin. Um, I just think that actually it's interesting to see what's going on. 
I still I get slagged off for it, even though I'd say my out of London is about forty five percent, which I can. You don't say about. You know that. You've yeah, forty five percent. Yeah. Um, the next one uh, happens to be um, from somewhere on the Wirral, funnily enough, and the one after that from Liverpool, mm. and then from Birmingham. Okay. Just making a point. Right. Um, but I do it. I do, I do it because there's texture and because it's interesting and because my working life in other parts of my working life also takes me around the country. So why not pick up a review? But it has to be said, I've had numerous situations where, you know, we did, a, I do a radio show called The Kitchen Cabinet for Radio 4. And so we go to, we only do two of the 20 a year from London. 18 of them are elsewhere. Perfect opportunity to pick up a review. I was, we were doing a show from Exeter. I spent a week trying to find somewhere that was worth writing about. And there was nowhere. Literally nowhere that was worth putting in a <laughs> newspaper column. It's not to say that every single restaurant was terrible, just an awful lot of them were. Well, dumb. We, we will come on to that. That's a, an interesting point about how, how restaurants uh, make your selection. Mm. Uh, my next question, and it kind of ties into what we came in on, um, is if you're writing purely to sell papers, and that's the end of it. Does restaurant criticism make a difference? Do you, do you have an impact? Is there examples of where it's, it's changed All right, things? So, so what I'm telling you, I, it, it, my job is to sell newspapers. That is my primary concern. What I'm telling you is that it, I'm not actually there for the restaurant business, however <laughs> infuriating those in the restaurant business find that. I do know that a positive review of mine can have a positive impact. Um, you know, that they get 500 to as many as 500, 1,000 phone calls as a result. Hurrah for me. But... You have to put that in the context, of the context of the number of people who are reading me. Reviews of mine, you know, have, have gone up to half a million page views on one week. Plus, we've got the newspaper plus. So I think probably fair to say there's a reach globally of millions. And yet, if you were to look at the 25, it's generally 25 positive reviews a year, mm -hmm. much more than the negative. And imagine that each one of those resulted in 500 phone. That's 12,500 people lift, lifting a phone as a result. It means that 98% of the people who read me are never going to actually do anything as a result of my reviews, apart from delight in the glittering prose. Yes, of course, <laughs> always the prose. But I think for individual restaurants, those numbers are small in the context of the Guardian's reach, but they're still big for the restaurants. Oh, no, that's absolutely true. And yeah. I, you know, and, uh, but I, and, and sometimes you know, I get people saying, the restaurant will write to me and say, thank you. To which well, the only response I can give is, it, 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 and, I, and it sometimes sounds a bit pious, I say, there is no need to thank me. You did your job and then I did mine, and that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I'm not looking for gratitude. I'm professionally disinterested, um, completely. I, I think there's um, an additional angle to this as well. There's um, a concept in, in the art world that's called critical engagement, where if, a, if an artist wants their career to progress, they have to go through these little building box, you get, uh, you get a group show and then maybe you get a solo show mm -hmm. and then maybe you get picked up by a big collector and then a public institution will purchase you and it kind of escalates you. Um, and I know it's a specific example, but you in Manchester have been doing fantastic Japanese food for a long time and you came along and gave it a great review. And off the back of that, suddenly they won a couple of awards, they got in the Good Food Guide. And I, I think there's a way that if Jay reviews it and gives it a good re review, people then treat it as it must be good because Jay reviewed it and it gets noticed. That, uh, that may or may not be the case. I, I wouldn't even speculate on it myself because it's not something I would ever consider. And I'm sorry if that sounds like I'm being no, not at prof all. professionally sort of obstructive on that point. But when it comes to thinking about what the hell am I going to fill 1,100 words with this week? I mean, one of the points I often make uh, to people um, is that there are an awful lot of restaurants, particularly pubs, gastro pubs, in this country um, and they all have the same menu. So it's a goat's cheese and beetroot salad, a terrine and a risotto to start. It's a sea bass, a pork belly and a ribeye for the main. And there's a lemon tart and a chocolate fondant and a creme brulee for dessert. <laughs> we know I've this menu. There. It's, it's yeah. practically the national menu. <laughs> and any number of gastro pubs are doing it and any number of them can be doing it brilliantly. But I would have literally not a word to write about that. So I don't go there because there's nothing to say. And people say, there's a lovely you know, gastro pub down the road in X and it does in there. And, you know, well, I, Christ, what's my story? There's nothing, you know, I'm still a journalist and I'm still a reporter in that regard. It, it, it's taken me forward a little bit in my carefully constructed list of questions. But uh, let's, let's pick I'm that, here to sabotage. Let's pick that up. How, how do you select your restaurants? Because I, I know that 
people put themselves forward. I know that PRs will hound you in a very effective PR way. I know that you do your own Not research. Not always. That. I mean, own places. If a PR wants to be desperately ineffective, they can uh, send me an email saying, we'd love to book you in. How often do I have to tell people that I book under a pseudonym and I don't accept comps of any kind? Amazing. I've got, I've got three of them on my, on my email today from apparently professional PRs who clearly haven't ever bothered to read the column. So a lot of that goes on. Um, but So, yes, th there's a variety of things. I'm looking at the press releases that come in on my emails. I'm looking at the back chat on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm sending emails to the likes of Tom Hetherington saying, I've what's happening in Manchester? You've had those emails. I have had those emails. And you've been responsible. It's not always ended well. <laughs> um, just saying. You're out of control. Um, there's a difference between in London and out. Mm -hmm. So in London, it's just ridiculous. And Marina O'Loughlin and I are constantly dividing that city between ourselves. Actually, the rest of the country as well, as it happens. But it's less of an issue. And then if I am doing a kitchen cabinet or one of my live shows, I'm looking at where I'm going and I'm saying, what can I review? I have to say, I've got one of those situations. I'm, I'm due to be Herefordshire way. And I'm desperately looking for something. And it suddenly dawned on me that it might be impossible. Have you and that's got stuck? Completely stuck. I'm, I'm not completely stuck yet, but there are various options I don't want to do because they look predictable or dull or, yeah. So They're if not anyone knows Herefordshire dining, then CJ at the end of the Yeah, I do. No, I'm quite, I'm quite serious. And I, uh, I think it's kind of interesting that we bang on and on about the restaurant revolution and the food revolution. And yet here I am in 2016 and I'm going to a whole effing county and I'm not sure I can find anywhere to review that would be of interest. OK, so th I think that's an interesting point. There's a, there's a really nice quote from Steve Coogan in, in The Trip, which I know you've quoted before yourself, where he said, eventually you find yourself far from home, sitting in front of a bowl of orange soup, trying to think of something to say. Yeah. How do you write a review? I know you've done the Guardian Masterclass up here before about food writing, but do you have something almost set in your mind before you go in, a framework? Or yes, I generally do. If I've chosen a place, it's because I think there is some sort of story that I can pull on that will give me something to write about. Now, it may well be that when I get there, something will happen that will turn that story on its head, and it won't be that story, it'll be something else. But I go in thinking... Uh, this is what the point of this review is. Um, it's, you know, it's about the spread of small plate dining. It's about how much you're willing to pay for a steak or, or whatever. Yeah. You've, and then, uh, and then onto that comes the question of was this place any good? Did it deliver on the, the value for money? Can I get any knob gags in that the sub editors <laughs> will not take out? Um, but you're looking for the hook, or you, I suppose what I'm you're saying... I'm looking for the story. I'm still yeah. a reporter. Uh, how, someone saying to you, I've got a really great restaurant, isn't necessarily good enough to catch your attention. No. Because lots of people have good yeah, there, there, are, there, there are lots of restaurants where you could have a perfectly fine night uh, eating in, but I might just not be able to generate 1,100 interesting words. I mean, I might be able to generate 1,100 really tedious words, but then, you know, why not leave that to the bloggers? Oh, Jay, <laughs> he's in a terrible That's mood it. Well, today. actually, you see, the thing is, people often say to me, um, what, what's the difference between you and a blogger? That was going to be I, my next question. I know. And actually, the point is that uh, I'm being paid, and I better be damn sight better than those bloggers. And I better be thinking very seriously in, about these things, and about the craft of writing, and about delivering a compelling and entertaining column. Whether it is or isn't... It's for other people to decide. I, I can see the page views on a weekly basis because we have the, you know, the, the software to measure the metrics. I can see how many times it's being shared on social media. I, I, those are the things that I have to use. And I can see how pissed off the commenters get. But that's, that's the point. If I'm going to be a pro, if I'm going to be paid for it, I better write better than the people who are doing it for free. And is there also a difference maybe that you've got the dynamic between you and an editor? It's, it's not just your writing. Edit you editors are absolutely vital. Um, I get a pretty soft run with my editors at The Observer, though I would say that I've spent 25 years to get to that point, so that I would like to think that you know, I think as much like my own editor as writer. But there are, when I file my column, it goes to three people. It goes to a commissioning editor on the desk, it goes to the editor of The Observer magazine, and it goes to the production editor. And so all of them are reading it. And then there's two, other, two or three other people who all might have comments. Now, in my case, there are generally not an enormous number of comments. 
The column then comes back to me in proof for me to check the furniture, the headline and the stand first, but also to spot uh, my awful phrasing or something I've got wrong or something that's an echo of a phrase that I used two weeks ago so that I can correct it and make sure that it's not repetitive. Yeah. I once got caught out by um, a, a blogger who hates me for using the same phrase. I was absolutely dis dis I was distraught about it. He found me using the same phrase four times over 18 months. Uh, and I was horrified. Uh, that's the kind of... That's now, what an editor is there for. Uh, that's what, yeah, well, it, almost impossible for anybody to spot it but me. I should have spotted it, and I didn't. Just gave him ammunition. Okay. So we, we've established that you're, you're effectively there to sell papers, but you, you are also there to pass judgment on... Yes, but, but, but in the process of selling papers, the column has to be believable, has to be authoritative, exactly. has to actually you know, be something that people look at and go, well, Rayner knows something. Yeah. So not. how, in the current kind of landscape, how do, you, how do critics fit in alongside guides? You have guides which are uh, generated by Joe Public, guides which have experts, you know, paid experts going around with long experiences in the industry. H who takes what seriously and who's We're the doing disco after what? the AGM. Are you? I think we are. So I, I'm not writing a guide. Yeah. Uh, guidebooks are there for a particular reason. I'm writing a weekly column about how much pleasure your money will get you. Uh, nothing dates as quickly as a restaurant review. Uh, I often get people writing to me saying, will you include details on whether there are vegetarian dishes, whether there's pipe music, whether there's disability access, whether there are gluten-free dishes, and on and on and on and on. And I say I will write about those things if they're relevant, if they, if they impinge upon my experience. You know, if it turns out that half the menu is uh, non-meat, that's interesting because of the way they've done then that's going to be in the review. But no, I'm not going to give you an enormous panel listing this stuff because in 2016 there's a thing called the internet and you can bloody look it up for yourself if you're that interested. And uh, now that there, there is the internet, yes, um, there was, a, there was a, a piece in Cynthia's report uh, which the headline was Everyone's a Critic. And it was looking at you know, the change and it's, it's been an unbelievable change. There's so much stuff in Tech House where Everyone can now be a critic. Everyone can uh, have every, an opinion. Uh, yeah, everybody advisor. can have an opinion. The question is, how much weight does that opinion carry? Um, I, if I was a restaurateur, looking at it from the business side, or a chef, would hate the crowdsourced opinion sites. TripAdvisor is an effing nightmare. That's why I uh, was one of those who, you know, put my weight, sizable weight, <laughs> behind uh, the idea that you had to show a receipt to be able to review. Uh, there's no way of being able to guarantee that any of those reviews on TripAdvisor have anything going for them. And that I can tell you one of the things that will guarantee that I won't be going is if it's got a TripAdvisor certificate of excellence. <laughs> it's, it, it, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, it's the equivalent of having the clap. I'm not going. <laughs> um, I think Gary burnt his, didn't he? Did, that, did they not catch fire? Did you burn yours? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's Excellent. a kitchen. These things can happen. Um, and, and then you've got the bloggers. And yes, uh, now the interesting thing about the, the blogger or or whatever is that if they're any good at what they do, they tend to end up being paid for it pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and we, we find them and we take them in and we make them ours. <laughs> uh, but it's still, you know, you've still got to look at the numbers. So uh, as I've said, some of my reviews can, you know, I did a review of a restaurant called Beast and... Mm. Um, it was, that was full of a lot of knob gags. <laughs> and that one was viewed well over half a million times. Because of the knob gags? Um, because of the elegance yeah. of the knob <laughs> gags. And I don't think there are any bloggers who, are re who have that sort of reach. So it's very easy to go, oh, old media, so over. No, I don't think it is. I, I now regard old media as being the one which has money behind it. And so I would actually now include within or professional media the likes of BuzzFeed and Vice and us mm. against the bloggers who are doing it for free. Our reach is huge, and it's still huge. Do you think <coughs> bloggers are actually more important in somewhere like Manchester or Liverpool or Leeds? Because if you live in London, then every national, inverted commas, critic tends to review a London restaurant every weekend. You read 10 reviews of London restaurants, whereas if you're in the north of England, you don't actually get to read that many reviews of restaurants that are close to you. The restaurants don't get to, to get well, the coverage. You, you, may, you may well have a point. The problem, I think, is that, you know, you talk to me about ethics and I don't take free meals and all of that sort of stuff. There's a lot of bloggers taking freebies without declaring it, a lot of bloggers doing PR on behalf of them without making it absolutely clear that they've taken money, websites doing that. 
um, and it's made it a very, very murky business. But you, you may be right that actually, because we are, we're not reviewing as much here People as People like are, to read about their local yeah. restaurants. Um, although I'm not, <laughs> that said, I'm not vastly aware of who those bloggers are. I mean, I do the searches because I, 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 I do look at food bloggers to see what they're saying and I've, I've made some lucky scores as a result of that. I will shamelessly take my tips from anywhere. Um, and I will at least acknowledge them. Mm. I usually do acknowledge if I've nabbed this one Found from a it. blogger. Yeah. Um, but I'd be curious to know what the reach is. Okay, so going back to the, um, the, the kind of regional thing again, it, is, the, is there an absolute difference between when you review in London and when you review out? If someone dropped you blindfolded into a restaurant, could you tell I'm out of London or I'm in London? Depends if there was a huge fuck off tree in the middle of the restaurant. <laughs> You might have mentioned this in your recent MEN column that you think we're big on trees. No, it was and Simon Binz's MEN column, nothing to do with me. Yeah, sorry, yes, which you kindly uh, provided some words. Yeah. You think we're big on trees and frippery? I think was possibly Let, one of the other Let's be clear: things. there's more than enough stupid frippery in London restaurants. I mean, you know, a man uh, with unnaturally white teeth and skin like a walnut table opened a restaurant called Sexy Fish. Yes. Which, if ever there was a sign of a midlife crisis, that was it. Um, and the stupidities in that restaurant are legion. So I, I, I would not say that it, it, it is purely a Manchester condition. <laughs> but there have been a number of restaurants in this city which I feel have been a bit self-sabotaging through focusing on things which aren't necessarily to do with the food. What troubles me about it, and, I, and it's the same, I, you know, I react very badly to it in London as well, if you do go into a restaurant, the press release for this particular place, the one with the tree, did bang on about the tree for three <laughs> paragraphs. Just endless about the tree. And all I'm thinking is, so if you didn't have the tree, would the sea bass cost 16 quid instead of 18? If you're, if you're sitting there looking at the decor thinking, how much is that effing tree costing me? There's a problem. OK, so no trees. That's a, another tip. Use those notebooks. Trees, over-engineered tables, um, mini chip pan fryers, slates, boards, mini wheelbarrows for apple sauce, <laughs> flat caps for bread. Yeah, that really angered you, didn't it? That really, well, only because I, I found myself one. looking at the flat cap going, is this flat cap second hand? If it is second hand, whose head has been in the flat cap? <laughs> whose head has been in my bread basket? <laughs> it was not a good look. And no. it was a second hand flat cap. Anyway, they've stopped doing it now. That's good. OK. I, normally, in this sort of interview, yeah. I, I, would, I would ask about opinions on trends, what's next, what's going to be the next big thing. But I know you, you hate things like that, and you say you always get them wrong anyway. I think it's a mugs game. Um, I, I, I am interested, certainly for, for Manchester, it's clear that finally uh, various players from around the country are moving in. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawksmoor has proved that it can be done successfully. Um, there was a rumour about one of the big sort of mass um, Mumbai Indian chains possibly opening up here. Yep. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. What was interesting from the entrepreneurial debate you were having before is I, I absolutely agree with Nick that the real blight at the moment is the so sophistication of the mid-market. So I'm talking of the Coates and the Wagamamas and Zizi and Jamie's Italian and all of this. Whatever you think of those restaurants, they are extremely sophisticated at what they do. And every time an A3 license site comes up, anywhere in any town in the country, I know it's the same in Manchester, they're all piling in and the landlords are going, well, I get my premium, I get my rent, and it, I'm never going to lose. So then an independent has a far harder time to, to get in there. Um, and I think there's a, an onus on uh, local authorities to start being clever about where they grant their A3 licences ideally on sites that one of those big players could never even dream of fitting into. It's worked very well in South London, in Brixton, where I live, uh, with these covered markets, old Victorian covered markets, various sites that could never have been the home to a Byron or an Ask or a Zizi. And small businesses have started off, and it's down to an enlightened view on the part of uh, council planning officers to putting A3 licences in there. God, that was tedious, wasn't it? No, I, I, you got. Yeah, everyone likes licensing talk. Do they? Yeah, I think Kite's licensing solicitors are in the room somewhere. They'll have been all over that. They'll have loved yeah. that. 
So going back to the uh, the, the the trends, I, I yeah. think you've done quite a clever in, inversion because you say you don't like talking about things that you think you'll see. So what you did was make a big list of the things you hate and you don't want to see next yes, year. Yes, yeah. And I thought that was quite a clever way of getting around it. So I thought, kind of like a poke and provoke thing, I would, yeah. I would just list the things and, and you would flare up and uh, say witty uh, things about fantastic, them. Fantastic, wouldn't it? Yeah. So the things that annoyed you that you want to see the end of in 2016, and I don't know whether the North does this more or less than anywhere else in the Go country, not writing orders down. Not writing orders down. Now, um, I'm just a control freak. I'm actually ill-suited to being a restaurant critic because I'm always in fear that nothing's going to happen the way I wished. Yeah. Um, and so if you're, the waiter you know, stands there and doesn't take an order with a notepad and pen, I am now in a constant state of anxiety. It doesn't help that I do know that, bless them, quite a lot of people working front of house lead you know, sometimes quite full-on lives <laughs> and um, are probably still coming down from last night. So, you know, I don't think it's entirely unreasonable for me to fear that they won't necessarily get my order right. Fair enough. That sounds quite valid when you put it like that. Um, I love them all. Small plates formats, but then having a table that's too small oh, for all the many plates. shoot me now. Yeah, we recommend that you order two to three plates each, so there are three of you sitting on this table, so that's nine, but the table can only take four. The small Mine. plates format was your fucking idea, not mine. <laughs> get a big enough table or get, a, you know, get another format. Okay, it, I think this is potentially uh, linked, but one of the other things that earned your ire was uh, dishes served when they are ready. Oh, yeah, well, you see, again, it's the paranoia. Um, they say, well, the kitchen just sends them out in the order, you know, when they fancy. And you think, I can't quite keep up with my order. I can't remember whether I've had everything. Have I had everything? No, I haven't had everything. Is something else coming? And why is that? I think you should write it down. And then you'd know, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> I've got to the point where I'm writing it down. But, but it's also about rhythm. Meals have a rhythm. They do have a sense. Even if you go to a Chinese restaurant and you say, um, I'll have the, uh, the soup, and then I'll have the crispy duck, and then I'll have the... They, although that is a place, you know, it's the original place for small dishes or sharing plates, there tends to be a rhythm to where it's done, and they, and they create a rhythm. Whereas a lot of these places don't, because... The guy on uh, veg can get them off well before the guy on fish and dessert is, you know, going to turn up right in the middle of the risotto, and that's not going to make anybody happy. No, it doesn't sound like I a like that's for an success. overstatement, and I apologise for doing that for effect. Go on. The, the the next one, it's it's just one word, and it actually sounds quite ominous on its own. Granola. Yeah, um, granola. Th this was a particular disease of MasterChef contestants who kept throwing granola onto main courses. And just that shouldn't it. be done. Just stop it. It's not clever. It's not funny. Too many people are watching. The next one, I, I don't know whether this is a, an age thing, but lighting. Lighting in restaurants makes you I'm angry. very old. Mm. I now need glasses. And if I go into a restaurant and I'm suddenly thinking that I've actually entered the second phase of macular degeneration, this, this is going to ruin my dinner. Just, uh, you know, when you get your iPhone out and you're having, oh, bloody hell, and you're putting the torch on because... That's the only way you can bloody see anything. Uh, th this is not an aid to, di to the digestion at all. No, okay. Um, two, two related ones now. Taking bread away. Actually, I'm just mystified by this. If there is anybody in this room who can tell me which manual it was written in, that at the end of the starter, if someone says, would you like some more bread, and you say no, they're going to take the small plate away and never offer you bread ever again. <laughs> what is that about? Does, has anybody been through one of those silver spoon training schemes who can say it's because X or Y? It's like it's a punishment. You, they always remove the blood plate. Nobody's hands going up here. Nobody has an explanation no. for this. It's, a, it's another bread-related thing here. Unsalted butter. Oh, I, I am willing to accept that that's taste on my part. Mm -hmm. Good taste on my part. Yeah. Um, unsalted butter has an important place in cookery. But in on bread, it's just like a big lump of fat in your mouth. Now, obviously, I'm a man who likes a big lump of fat in my mouth, but <laughs> not You should butter. put that in a column. Should Your I? Your page views would be massive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, salt and pepper. The interesting thing is, I actually think it's more of an affectation to leave them off the table than really about control. It is about the cook saying, uh, my dish is perfect, and uh, that's the way I want you to eat it. It's, a, it's, it's just a control issue. OK, we've got two... two I am quite positive about restaurants. I do like them. I know. I am focusing on the downside here. Yeah. I, f I feel like I'm doing you a disservice. Um, two wine-related ones now. Plastic sleeves for wine lists. 
your finger's just sticky. Uh, and you, you, well, it just looks you. cheap. What are you doing? Um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be necessary. We know that printing them out is, is pretty easy. This, uh, the next one, it sounds a bit OCD again. Uh, you want wines cheapest upwards on the list. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, clearly playing to my uh, concerns about being the restaurant critic for one of the poorest national newspapers in the country. <laughs> so obviously I go for the, and everybody tells me it's not the good value one, the second cheapest on the list. And that is the uh, rumour. Um, but uh, it is somewhat irritating when the wine list has been constructed in a way to show off the knowledge of whoever's constructed the wine list rather than easy access for you on a budget because there's nothing more humiliating than I have to search through the fingers going, no, I can't afford that, no, I can't afford that. Oh, Christ alive, who affords that? And then finally you find the Muscaday at £17 a bottle, and you go, oh, I can do better than that. <laughs> and then you're trying to find the one at 23 quid, which is always the pick pool. Yes, it quite often is, actually. Um, next one, uh, uh, this is the one I've heard often, um, yeah. filling wine glasses. Even, yeah. even taking your wine away at some point. I had a situation in the Castle Hotel in Taunton where they did take the wine away to the far end of the room and I, 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 my glass sat empty for about 20 minutes. I was by myself and eventually I managed to get the attention of the waiter and said, could I have a refill please? He went to the, the wines at the end of the room then came back and said, which one was yours? Brilliant. I think, you know, and as to the filling the wine glass thing, um, if I go out for, and this is a line from the show, but this is true, if I go out for dinner with my wife, we split a bottle of wine down the middle. I drink faster than she does, so if you fill my glass every time I finish it, she's not going to get as much of the wine as I am, and my evening's not going to end the way I was hoping. <laughs> I do not want to explain this to the wine waiter. <laughs> I just want to say, we'll fill the glass ourselves. But have you tried this? You tried this with a wine waiter, and, and they look like you have taken away their very reason for existing. You have disenfranchised them. Why did they get up in the morning? What's it about? You've come in and you've stamped all over their hopes and dreams, when really you're just saying is, I'll fill the glass myself. Yes, OK. And the, the final one, um, bills to men. Or I think it was actually bills to anyone at the table who has testicles, is what you said. It is amazing. If you talk to women about this, it happens so often. It is 2016, and yet the number of times you're, someone asks for the bill, and instead of asking who would like the bill or putting the bill in the middle of the table, they'll give it to the nearest man. I've heard reports of... <laughs> The most amazing one of, of, of a woman passing over a card, it being put in the machine, and then the machine being passed to the nearest man. <laughs> and I, w I wouldn't have included it if it hadn't been something that I'd uh, told about or seen on multiple occasions. It's absolutely extraordinary. Brilliant. Well, I hope, I hope venting has you know, made I you feel, feel a little better, better like a kind of primal but, screen. Uh, and I, I do feel the need to say this. I do this job and have been able to do this job God, for 17 years. My job is almost old enough to, to get married without my permission. Um, because I love restaurants. I still love restaurants. And the vast majority of my reviews are positive. In any one year, 25 are likely to be positive, 15 or 16 middling, and fewer than a fifth of them will be the negative ones. It's just that the negative ones are the ones that people remember. I, in fact, that's, that does go back to an earlier point, because you, you made clear that you, you put a lot of research and diligence into selecting your restaurants. Yes. So, does that mean, therefore, that you pick a restaurant that you know is going to be awful? No. Is that where the bad reviews come from? No. Where um, do the bad reviews come from? They're like car crashes and colds. They happen to me. Yeah. It is, it is fair to say that there are some big ticket openings in London a bit like West End shows. If there's a, a big West End show opening, the, the theatre critic has to go. So if there's a big London opening, I have to go. So if Novikov opened, for example, which was the massive all single dancing movie, I'd, yeah, got to go along and see what it was like. In the same way that Marina took Sexy Fish, she had to go and see. Um, I could possibly, going into that one, have a view as to what it's likely to be. But generally, no, I do not go looking for a bad restaurant. Why would I? I, um, because I don't want to sit through them. I really don't. And, and uh, yes, people say, but surely they're more fun to write. Uh, they can on occasion be more fun to write, but you've got to do it from a real place because it just stinks to high heaven if someone thinks, oh, he's just doing it to play to the gallery. Um, yeah, it, it, okay. it, that's why it doesn't happen that often. Right, well, we're, we're going to start winding this up on, on a positive. You have reviewed a lot up north. Um, what was your best review? What was your best experience? You got the whole of the North to go out. Oh. Put you on the spot. 
I think, and this is, uh, I, there are a couple of places that I have reviewed in here very positively, so obviously I love the Parker's Arms, I had to say that, mm. um, and I love the Swanet uh, fence. Yeah. But actually, I think it was stumbling into the Oak Bank Hotel in Grasmere, which is not even the third best hotel in Grasmere, to find a brilliant mm. guy called Darren Comish was cooking. Turned out that day he cooked entirely by himself and served the most astonishing meal. Um, in the most humble, we were the only people in there. A brilliant price. He's now gone off to be the, he, he came to something like third in MasterChef Pro afterwards, and he's now head chef at Holbeck Gill. Um, but that one, just that sense of coming across a talent hidden away somewhere very, very quiet. That's a real pleasure. You know yeah. you're going to make a difference. Yeah. And that readers are going to enjoy reading it. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, questions? we are going to take some questions, but just, just before we do, I, I decided I was going to put a little fun element, hopefully a fun element oh, in fun. there. Oh, fun. And uh, you've, played, you've played into my hands in the most spectacular fashion. I couldn't have planned it better. You touched on the idea of repetitive phrasing that your editors have to stop you doing. What we're going to do, we're going to have a little competition for charity. Yeah. Uh, and I, I will put £100 of my personal money into hospitality action yeah. and action against hunger if the audience on a show of hands basis can tell me, has Jay Rayner used the phrase puck to refer to a kind of circular compressed food, maybe a fish cake or something like that, more than 10 times or less than 10 times? Fewer. Fewer. Pedant. <laughs> I need an editor. Fewer than 10 times. So you've done a Google search I've on me. I've done a Google search. It did come up more than once, so I'm going to give you a clue. You refer to a lot of foods as being in the form of a puck, and your editor hasn't yet picked you up on it. Hang so on, hang on. Before you do this and before there's a vote, I think I should write what I think on a piece of paper. Okay, let's do that. That's an even, an even bigger layer of fun. So we're going to do a show of hands for fewer or more. Hang, hang on, let me get my answer down. Can I point out that <laughs> I, having been doing this job for 17 years, 50 restaurants a year, I have reviewed over 850 restaurants. Mm -hmm. Just saying. OK. And just for clarity, he has written about Wolfgang Puck. That's not included in the count. <laughs> it has to be Puck-based food. So could we ha have a show of hands for fewer than 10 times? <laughs> Two, OK, I think this is going to be pretty clear. More than ten times. And there we go. And I, I have to Hang say... Hang on. What did you say? Do you want to do yours now? He went more than ten times. You are correct. A quick, and it, and it was pretty quick, Google search, 12 times. Oh, I only need 12. 12 times I you have think. referred to a puck of food. All sorts of things in puck format. It's almost as if they see you coming and quickly reform whatever your myth was into a puck. Well, Amazing. the disc. Let's so, go through the synonyms. Action Against Hunger, Hospitality Action are £200, Richard, which is, uh, which is a fantastic thing. <laughs> yeah, very good for the charity. There is, if, ever, if everyone is happy to sit down for a couple of minutes, there is another little bit of fun we could have, which is raising money for charity. Go it on. doesn't involve you, so you're oh, all right on this okay. one. So yesterday, it refers back to the first panel. Yesterday we got, a, we got um, an email out the blue from the, the PA of one of the panellists uh, who was sending over there the rider that they would like um, to have backstage. So I'm going to read it out, and then we're going to have a little show of hands as to which of our four lovely panellists we think this rider might have come from. So backstage, personal dressing room, bench press with weights up to 180 key, three bottles of two-litre Evian, silk robe, any colour, quality street, they're a fan of the green ones, so maybe add a few more, but don't make it obvious. Selection of Fruit of the Loom t-shirts, large, white or grey. And then on stage, the person in question doesn't have a best side really. They say face on is best, so they'd like to be centre stage. After their speech, they'd like to have a thousand balloons to fall from the <laughs> ceiling like at a political rally. Can they have a moist towel on stage to mop their brow? Uh, and they need a shot of malt whiskey with a fresh lime squeezed in, two cubes of ice. Don't know if you're having entrance music, but X is partial to Eye of the Tiger or Sicko by Rex the Dog. So, show of hands again, £100 to Hospitality Action, £100 to Action Against Hunger, if you guys get this right. Do we think that that might have come from Nick? That's <laughs> literally zero. Cynthia, could it have been Cynthia? 
No, still. John, is he still in the room? Could it have been John? What sort of fragile egotist could have sent such a thing? Could it be Gary Usher? <laughs> You've cost me another £200. Yeah, absolutely correct. <laughs> it was from Gary Usher. So fantastic. That's money to the charity, and uh, you've helped to do that, so thank you very much indeed. Well, listen, we are going to take some questions now. Jay, if you would like to pick people who have their hands up. Claire has the roving mic. I think we've got time for two or three. Chap at the back who gets his hand up first. Hello, Rob. Hi. <laughs> You're all right, Rob. You've talked a lot about various things that you, you, the articles you write. What sets your heart aflutter when you walk in? What, what really excites you? What sets my heart aflutter is... Um, a very simply written menu. The English language is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And if somebody has taken the care to express the dishes using clear English, weirdly, that actually makes me think I'm in for good things. They're not overcompensating for something. Uh, they've either thought very carefully about how they're presenting the food, or they've got somebody else to do it for them. And it's about knowing what your skill set is. And quite often, Certain chefs, you know, uh, it's interesting that there are quite a lot of dyslexics who go into to catering. They, they find another skill set. And you generally should get the person who could do that the best. A clear written menu um, is, a, is a thing that really does get me going. Okay. Anyone else? Arms in the air? Lady over here. Yeah, no, it's you. Hi. Um, I wondered if you were talking about the difference between yourself and, a blo and bloggers, and I wondered if you would say that, can you tell the difference between uh, a restaurant that's just generally serving bad food or that it's just been a bad day at the office for somebody, you know, because it's quite harsh. There what bloggers do to restaurants and chefs sometimes. Um, or what, from, the, from reading a blogger's account or from being in the restaurant? Um, you, from, in a restaurant, when you're experiencing that there, as a diner. There are two types of bad. <laughs> there is... Bad where they're doing absolutely everything they intended to do. It's just that everything they intended to do is stupid. <laughs> I.e., their whole approach is bad. And then there's um, where they're trying to do something quite sensible, but they're, they're not up to it. And that's where it started to fall apart. Um, you know, yesterday I was in a very strange tapas place, and one of the things was Coqui Saint-Jacques, which is a classic dish, Scallops it should be in a, a cream sauce burnished, and the sauce was watery. Um, and you look at it and you think, well, if you're going to put a classic on your menu and you can't pull it off, there's a problem. Um, is that down to you just having a bad day or not knowing how to do it? And I would tend to fall on the basis, given the amount they were charging for just this one scallop, that it was that they didn't know how to do it. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one more, if we can. I tell you, let, let's take the chap over the, the far corner and um, can we then slip a quick one in from Nick, I'm sure so to speak. We can do that. It's like reading one of your columns, Jay. Oh, I know. Hi. Um, just a quick one. Have you ever been tempted to revisit a restaurant that so you've given a good or a bad review, um, say, two years down the line, uh, based on what you said, that, like, a, a restaurant review? So do I ever, do I ever revisit? Um, I've revisited ones that I enjoyed regularly because I liked them, so I've gone back. Uh, I have not revisited any that I've had a bad time at um, on the basis that there are an awful lot of restaurants that I haven't reviewed once before I start reviewing some twice. Go on, you, uh, I'll repeat your question back to the room if the microphone's over there. Um, Jay, unlike Marina... Uh, you're very recognisable in public, and you, you book in a pseudonym. Yes. What happens when you turn up? Uh, what happens? So I book under a pseudonym. What happens when I turn up? Well, obviously do, do the trumpets, trumpets yeah. sound, <laughs> rose petals fall from the ceiling. No, <laughs> if if they are any good at what they're doing, nothing happens. You, I go up to them and say, you know, I um, uh, I have a table booked under the name Sophia Loren, and they go. <laughs> Yes, Ms. Loren, and they lead me to the table, and it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Uh, it's only the ones who are nervous about what they're doing who have a problem, um, who are uncertain about what they're doing. But most of the time, I, you know, it's very rare, actually, that, I, that there's any particular malarkey goes on. Can I answer the question very briefly, the mm. question that you've sort of asked? 
the people say, how can you therefore get an experience yeah. which is normal and representative of the restaurant? There are a number of things to say. The first one is I'm yet to find a bad restaurant that becomes a good one because I walk through the door. There's very little they can do once they've turned up. Two, um, I pay attention to what's going on on the other tables around me. So obviously, yes, they can make my table, you know, utter waiter frottage. But I'm, I'm spotting what's going on. I've seen other things going on on other tables. A guy from uh, Caprice once told me that if they have a critic in, they up the level on ser of service on all six tables around them. To which I said, well, if you can do that, you probably deserve a good review. <laughs> but the bottom line, and this brings us entirely full circle, and it's a good way to go out, is that my job is to write as convincing and compelling an authoritative a column as I possibly can. And if, as a result of my lack of anonymity, people stop believing what I'm saying and believe, don't believe what I've said, don't believe the stories I'm telling, then I will lose my job to, because they believe me, there's a number of people who quite like my job. And so it is my job to carry on writing in a way that makes that element of me completely irrelevant. Fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. As you say, a very nice point at which to end it. So <clears throat> that is the end of this year's NLB debate. So thank you to our sponsors, MMU. Um, and our panellists, uh, Jay, Cynthia, John, Gary and Nick, who have been so generous, so honest, so forthright, and I, I found it massively interesting. I hope you have too. Could we all have a round of applause for all five panellists? It was a great event. It went very, very well. Um, it's always fun. Tom's a very good interrogator, um, and it's a lively audience. Uh, this is a bunch of people who care about restaurants, which is my kind of crowd. I don't think that there can be ever a downside to getting a lot of people together who are in the same industry because that's how you get ideas and that's how you get support and that's how you get a sense that you're not alone and it can be quite isolating in the restaurant business and to know that you're part of something is very important.